actually look at the concept of the Messiah. The Messiah from the Old Testament all the way through New Testament and up into heaven at the throne. Because that's vital to us to understand what it meant to Christ. By understanding what these things mean to Christ, we are better able to apply them to ourselves on a daily basis. But the one aspect that we will talk about a little bit this morning is the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And a little bit of what it meant to him, but primarily what it means to us today. Uh, we were praying for a, a second father to me, uh, of me, uh, Galen Anderson, for quite a while. He passed on just last month. Uh, before he passed, I had a blessing of a conversation with him. It was the week before he went to KU up in Kansas City for more evaluations, uh, more testing, and everything else. But he made this statement. He said, time is a blessing of God that we allow Satan to control. Let me say that again. Time is a blessing of God that we allow Satan to control. Now, Galen had this ability to make these very short, very simply understood statements, but once you hear it, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. But if you sit back and you start thinking about it, you start reflecting upon the meaning of that, it's life-changing if you really look at this. Because all we have is a limited amount of time in this life. But we backfill it with everything else. Our life gets crazy. And there's some analogies. Our life is uh, equated to this concept of a roller coaster. And our roller coaster is just full of turns, twists, corkscrews, drops, slow times, fast times. But in that analogy, we're a spectator. We have no control. It doesn't matter what we do, what we try to change, anything else. I don't like that analogy. I like the analogy better of the mountaintop experience. A mountaintop experience, many of us understand this concept in the idea that when we're up there on this mountaintop, we're, we feel closer to God. We feel connected with God, our family, our friends, everybody around us. Things are going well. We walk with confidence. The path set before us, there is nothing that is going to stop us from continuing. There's no obstacles. It's bright out. It's clear, and we're able to verse this very easily. But the counterpart to that is the valley. And we have to have valley moments also in order to appreciate the mountaintops. Because without the valleys, the mountaintops would become mundane. Nothing different, nothing new. But you see, down in the valley, when we're down there, it's, it's darker, if you will. We don't feel that close to God. We don't feel that close to our family, our friends. We feel disconnected. We feel alone. We can't see the path that's set out before us, and we're having a difficult time navigating it. We're looking down. We're not walking with confidence, shoulders back, head up, walking fast. We're looking down, and we're, we're trying to navigate this path because of the obstacles. And the other part of this is the journey back and forth in between, going up and down this mountainside. This is all part of our lives, and there's moments in there that are life-changing. Even in the valleys, we have these life-changing moments for the positive. You see, this idea of these moments in time that Galen talked about, it's interesting when we start looking at it. And... He made this comment on this phone uh, call that I had with him. He wasn't uh, afraid to die, but he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready because he said, there, there's people I got to call. There's things I got to make right. There's people I have not shared the gospel with. And he said, until I was faced with a life-threatening disease, I never thought about time. Because he was like we are. We always put it off. I'll make that call tomorrow. I'll send that text later. I'll spend time in sharing the gospel with that person. It wasn't a right opportunity. It wasn't a good timing. And we always push things out thinking and hoping and praying we have more time. But when you're faced like Galen was with a life-threatening disease, all that comes into perspective. And this is part of what I want to talk about today, is this idea of these moments in time. 
Some can be life-changing, like I said. Some, not so much, and it's more of a seed, and you don't realize it until later on. And the effects that it had, and then looking back, that hindsight is really neat. I love hindsight, just wish it happened sooner. But this idea that we can see it in how it impacted our course. Um, very quickly, Galen uh, changed my life completely. Uh, I met him 30, 32 years ago. Out at the ranch he was operating, a horse ranch. I was 16 years old. I walked, thought I was 10 foot tall, bulletproof, nothing could touch me, didn't care what you thought, didn't care about anything else except for myself. At least that's how I portrayed myself. Inside I was scared, I was alone, had no concept of anything. I had no concept of family, friends, life, what it meant to be a man, much less. But Galen's other ability, he could see through your masquerade very quickly. And he used that as a starting point. And that's when he started investing time into me. It's because of that moment 32 years ago that I met my bride because of him, because I became a Christian. I met Cynthia and her three daughters at church. We got married. I am a grandfather now because of him. Uh, I stand before you because of him because of him investing moments into my life. And to give you an idea of how life-changing this was, we were in Arizona with my sister, visiting with my sister and my brother-in-law, and I was telling her about Galen, she knew about Galen, and uh, she made the comment that, I'm not too sure you would be alive today if it wasn't for Galen. That's how crazy my life was, and she's probably right. So he changed my life completely, physically and spiritually. But it was because of moments in time. So what I want you to do here just for a second is think back to when you were baptized. What changed when you were baptized? What changed in your life? Maybe priorities, maybe the commitment of you have given yourself over to Christ. See, back then was the beginning for us. That's when our relationship in this concept of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ occurred. But you see, the greatest moment that we have, not just for us individually, but totality of the world, is the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, because without that moment, we would be lost. There would be no hope. There would be no reason for change. There would be no reason to strive for better. You see, this death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, there's three perspectives that we can be looking at in this idea of what it means. This idea of us standing before the cross, Christ is still on the cross, and we see him there, but we're standing off. It's more of a spectator view, if you will. And what I mean by that is we're not engaged, we're not invested, there's nothing here nor there. I can walk away at any time. Yes, I know he's God. Yes, I know he's the Messiah. Yes, I know who he is, but I haven't committed to it. This idea is the concept of the uh, spectator where we can walk back and forth in between it in the idea that it has to be more than belief, though. James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You do well, believing that God is one. The demons believe also in shudder. So it has to be more than belief in this, this concept of who Christ is. You know, in Matthew chapter 8, and what's going on in Matthew chapter 8 is Jesus is traveling, and he's coming to the other side, and he lands there, and he meets a man that's demon-possessed. His name is Legion. He has multiple demons within him. Even he understood who Christ was. What do you have to do with a son of God? So the spectator concept has to be the beginning, but not the end. We have to start there with this moment in time with Christ. We understand that he died for us. And that brings us to the second concept. 
The second concept is this idea of us standing within the empty tomb. The stones rolled away, we can see outside, and there we can see the, linen, uh, the burial cloth all folded up neatly in its place, and we look out and we see the empty cross. Because we understand that it's more than just him dying, it's him being resurrected. It's about this idea that we start becoming stakeholders, if you will. We start participating in the plan of salvation. We start participating in the gospel. We start participating in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It starts there. You know, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2, it talks about this idea that what Christ had to do, that he had to die and he had to be raised. In the idea that it's not that God's arm is too short to save or his ear too dull that he cannot hear, but it is our transgressions, our sins that separate us from him. And it is that reason that he was put to death, that he was laid in the grave, and that he was raised. Because you see, the last thing that Satan had control over was death. That was his only toehold on humanity was because you die in the state that you're in, you're mine, Satan would say. But see, Christ overcame it. He removed that burden, that fear of death. You see, and then we transition into the idea that we're standing within the cross, or excuse me, standing within the tomb, the empty tomb, looking out to the empty cross, and we look past. And we see Christ seated in heaven at the right hand of God, I wish we had time to really understand and dig into this concept. What, why does he say he's seated, seated, seated at the right hand of God? It's not just for convenience or anything else. The most simplest way I can explain it is it's the concept of things are completed. He has finished what needed to be done, so he sits down. If you go through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament in the imagery of the temple and even the imagery of heaven when Christ would be pictured up there normally it was always standing because the work wasn't finished yet the priests at the temple never sat because the work was still ongoing there wasn't a sense of it being completed now when I say Christ is seated and it is completed it's not that this concept that okay things are in motion I'm stepping away I'm no longer involved I, I'm hands off and it's just gonna run its course I'm not saying that. It goes back to the idea that he overcame the last victor of becoming the last victor in the idea of overcoming Satan, death. He's finished in that. He's laid the path before us. He's laid it clear, and we just have to traverse through it and bring as many people as we can with us. Now, we still pray. We know that the Bible still talks about, and we believe earnestly, where two or three are gathered. He is there with us. He is here with us in this concept. We believe in answered prayers. We don't believe in the idea that he's a hands-off God. But that's the imagery of him seated, is that he has completed what was required of him in bringing about the salvation. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. This is going to be where we're primarily at in Luke chapter 9. We'll bounce around a little bit, but overall... That's where we're going to be. In Luke chapter 9, it starts off in verse 1, and it's talking about Jesus sending out his 12. He's given them power and authority over the demons and the ability to heal the sick, the diseased. And they go out, and while they're out, what happens next is Herod uh, becomes confused, perplexed of what's going on, because just recently he had put to death John the Baptist. So the disciples come back, report everything that's going on. And when they come back, another crowd gathers around Jesus, and he's teaching them. And we get into the first feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. The disciples wanted to set them away. We can't feed this many people. Let them go get their own food. Jesus says, we'll feed them. Um, and then it's Jesus and his disciples. Jesus is praying, and then all of a sudden he asks them, who do the people say I am? And they say, well, some say John the Baptist being raised. Some say Elijah. Some say other prophets. Uh, and then Jesus asks him, who do you say I am? And Peter, of course, answers and says, you are the Christ of God. 
and he warns him not to say anything because it's not time yet. There's a lot he has to accomplish and a lot of things they're not understanding. He says, I have to be handed over to the elders, the uh, Pharisees, and the scribes to be killed and raised on the third day. Verse 23 is where we're going to be at. It says, and he was saying, all, uh, saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. There's a couple of aspects I want to talk about this morning with you in this idea of anyone wishing to follow after me, this idea of where is he at? He's in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. If you want to get there, I'm going to give you three ways or three concepts of getting there that are required. You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross daily and then you follow me. So we're going to spend some time talking about what this means and what it means to us today in the idea of being a disciple of Christ. So this idea of denying. Denying is an interesting thing because it's, we'll talk about what it's not. Let's say you're on a diet and you got these sugar cravings going on. And this idea that you want that brownie, you want that cake, or for me, that lemon bar. You know what? I'm going to deny it for Christ. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying that concept. But what it's saying is a couple different things. This idea of denying is, well, let me ask you this. What's an idol? How would you describe an idol? Rejection, okay. What else? What's an Old Testament idol? The idea of the pagan gods, these wooden statues, gold statues. We don't have that today though, do we? Per se. They're still out there, I know, but not so much as uh, evidence as it was in the Old Testament. This idea of idol can be anything. You see, the physical idols were a lot easier for the Old Testament to deal with, and the idea it was physical, you could see it, you could avoid it. Today, an idol can be anything. And I believe it could have been that in the Old Testament too, but for today, in the 21st century, your job can be an idol. Your friends, your activities, your choices. What an idol is, is something that you place before you and God. That's an idol. Anything that's going to affect your relationship with God. So this idea of denying, it comes down to a couple different things in my understanding. Um, The idol can be The idea of, let's talk about family. Am I to deny my family for my relationship with God? Am I to turn my back on my family? I don't believe that's what it's saying. We can read about this concept in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus is preaching. He's teaching the multitudes. This large, large, large group comes at him to hear it. And then word got to him by one of the people there that, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here, and they wish to speak with you. He turned and he asked the question, who is my mother and my brothers? He looked at his disciples and he pointed at them and he said, you are my mother, my brother, my sister. And he went on and explained, anyone who does the will of my father who is in heaven is my mother, my brother, and my sister. It is that concept. Jesus had a very strong understanding of this idea of his relationship with God. Even his mother didn't come in between that. Now, even though he made that example, it's not saying to shun your family, to ignore them, to never talk to them. It's not saying that because we can look into John chapter 19. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, he sees, uh, he sees his mother and his favorite disciple, and he says to his mother, Mother, behold your son, to the disciple. And he says to the disciple, 
behold your mother. He wanted to make sure she was taken care of. We know that it wasn't that concept of, well, you know, you're going to interfere with my relationship with God. I'm going to shun you. That's not what he's talking about. But what he's talking about is this concept. All of you are here this morning. So I'm going to use you guys as an example. Now, there's times when we don't make it. I get that. Now, if you have typhoid, I don't want you to make it. Okay? Don't want you coming around us. Don't want you even here. But what ends up happening sometimes in the idea of we get into this worldly men's, uh, mindset of, well, I worked all hard all week. Saturday, I spent all day doing my errands, doing my work around the house, doing what was required of me. Sunday's the only day that I can sleep in. And that can be true. Don't get me wrong. But by you guys choosing to be here, at the designated time that, you, that the elders have chosen for us to meet, that's a sense of denying that sleep. That's the concept of what Jesus is talking about, is about denying yourself. Yeah, I would like to sleep in. Yeah, I would like more sleep, everything else. But I understand the urgency, and so do you, about being here, about what we can get out of this, about just not hearing the word of God, but about the fellowship, about catching up with one another, about the love and support that we have from one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he's talking about. We're going to go ahead and deny that sleep in order to be here. It's about denying things that come in between you and your relationship with God. The next one is the interesting one. It says to take up your cross daily. What do you think the cross is in this context? What have you heard that that means? Okay, ugly. Incon- We've made it a thing of beauty, but then it was, it was horrible. Oh, definitely. And you, you hit... Oh, definitely. Uh, and you hit both sides of it. It's ugly. It's horrible. It's a cruel death. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. But we tend to turn that to this idea of it's, it's a thing of beauty for the 21st century. I heard something over here also. Anything? I'm just hearing voices. I thought I took the blue pill this morning. Um, Okay. Anything that you have to suffer. Okay. Um, can you go farther with that? Give me an example. Well, uh, for example, you come down to the area of the city, you come down your habits, and that changes your whole way of thinking. It does. You're right. Yeah. I think that is definitely part of it uh, in the idea of the ailments and things that we suffer all the way from our jobs. Maybe the job isn't going well. You're getting, uh, you don't get along with your coworkers, your bosses, etc. Maybe marriage, maybe friendship. All of these ailments of different, uh, all the way from the physical to the mental to the spiritual, it all plays into it. But I think it has to be more. Uh, in this concept. Uh, Spencer on Sunday mornings is doing a wonderful job in his, uh, in his lessons about the Beatitudes, and he's using the analogy of the upside-down world and the idea that when Christ came, he's going completely contrary to what the world's view of way life is, and he's bringing in a new concept, and the idea of his kingdom is completely opposite of what the worldly kingdom is. And I'm saying that to say this. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, it talks about this idea that God, he causes the sun to rise and to set for the evil and the good. He causes the rain uh, to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all face these common things, and I'm not, these diseases that we're up against, they are severe and they are horrible things. But everybody suffers that. So if we're called out as the church, in the idea of this, uh, the Greek word ekklesia, it's set aside, it's set apart. We being the church, it has to be something more than that. That's part of it, I believe. 
but it has to be more that we're to bear. So like Paul was talking about, about this idea of, you know, in today's society, we tend to see the, the cross as, as something to, something of beauty, excuse me, in this idea of it's about grace, love, peace. But it, during the time of Jesus, it was whole, whole different concepts. As Paul talked about in the idea, it was a curse. It was suffering. It was pain. It was anguish. So go back there to the first century when the Romans, uh, the Roman Empire would decide that somebody needs to be crucified, rightly or unrightly. It didn't matter. They did it for entertainment just as well as punishment. So this idea, they would give this person the cross and they would have to carry it through the streets to wherever they were going to be crucified. This idea of bearing the cross, it's more than just a symbolic representation of, you'll see sometimes, Arizona, I would see it a lot. I don't know why I saw it a lot in Arizona. Of people walking down the highways with this giant cross up on their shoulder and they're walking down the road and it had a wheel at the back. Don't understand the wheel. I didn't think Jesus had a wheel, but it's okay. Uh, what they were trying to do, I'm not bashing them on that, but that's what we tend to think in the idea of what it meant to bear the cross. You see, in Roman times, in the first century, to bear your cross meant you're carrying the means of your own demise. It was complete humiliation, suffering, and punishment. Because you're going to your death, and you're carrying the means of your own death. Think about that. You know, during uh, World War I, World War II, there was a lot of horrible things, and we face it with uh, the wars that we're facing today with uh, the extremists and Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all of them in these crazy killings. Uh, it was last year, and it started the year before that, two years back, where Christians were being beheaded and videoed and posted up onto uh, media to flood the, uh, the masses. So if we take that scenario with the concept of what the Roman cross was in the first century, so you're being led out to this field to be beheaded. You're going to carry the very sword, the knife, that is going to do it. And then you're going to hand it over to them to kill you. That's the concept of what it means to bear your cross. Carry your cross daily. You see, we talked about this idea of just briefly in the idea of your, your baptism. You know, we can go into Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 11. And what goes on there is the symbolic representation that takes place when you're baptized. About how the idea of you go under the water, it represents the death of Christ. You're dying to yourself. When you come up out of the water, it's a newness of life. It's like the resurrection of Christ. You're coming up a new creation. The newness in your life. But back up to the submersion. That was us bearing the cross. Because if you remember back to it, there's a lot of different reasons and a lot of different uh, influences we have in these ideas, these moments in time that brought us to the point of being baptized. What would have stopped you from being baptized? I think I could say for most of us, nothing. Because we came to an understanding that it wasn't about us. It wasn't about me ruling myself. It wasn't about, this is a crazy thought, in today's world, we have this concept, nobody knows what's best for me but me. We self-govern, self-rule, self-justify, self-edify, and we place ourselves on the throne. But see, back at our baptism, that's not the case. Nothing would have stopped us because we came to the understanding it's dying to myself. It's not about me. The, the watery baptism, that, that just happens to be the way it's uh, played out in the uh, New Testament. Now, if the Bible said for you to uh, rebuild your relationship with Christ and to find salvation and start your salvation process, go stand on, the, uh, stand on your head in the corner for three days, get out of my way, I'm hunting a corner. It's whatever God required of us at that moment that we understood we're going to do it regardless of what people think, regardless of how it's going to look, regardless of the implications of this life-changing event that occurred. 
nothing would have stopped us because we understood the urgency of it. We understood the implications of it. We understood that it brought us back into a right relationship with God. That's what that cross is. That's what has to happen daily. So backing up here for a minute, this idea of denying self. How can you carry your cross daily if you're not denying yourself? You can't. So how do you deny yourself if you're not willing to carry your cross daily? You can't. They're connected is my point. You can't separate the two. Because if you just go through life denying yourself, you're going to be that spectator. You're not going to be part of that relationship with God, that, that view of the plan of salvation from the empty tomb looking past the empty cross into heaven and seeing Christ seated at the right hand of God in heaven. I'm saying all of this because I need it just as much as many people need it. we got to do self-checks every once in a while, reality checks, in this idea of who we are how we are called out to be different, how we are separate from the world. As Spencer says, we're part of the kingdom of the upside-down world, and that's our place. It's not to be part of this world. And the hardest thing for us today is this idea of understanding what it means to suffer as New Testament did. We don't face that in America. We rarely have ever faced that. There's been one-offs, I understand that, uh, where Christians have been killed. Uh, I, I understand that. Now, okay, you can take a number for the stoning request for what I'm going to say from Cynthia afterwards, and you guys can just take turns stoning me for this comment, but just hear me through. I don't wish harm upon anybody, but I wish we faced persecution in America because we've been lulled to sleep. Everybody's okay. Everything's all right. It's not that big of a deal. My, the one that just is like nails on a chalkboard for me, that's not a salvation issue. That one just drives me over the edge. We, we get into this hands-off approach to our relationship with God because we're not challenged. If we were persecuted to some extent, it would be a rally call. It would be a point that we can rally around, gather our strength, remember who we are, and move forward. But because we're lulled, and we're lulled for many reasons, we're desensitized all the way from TV, movies, all the way through the radio from our friends, from the manner of speech and what we're engaged in and what we're not, on and on the list goes, we're desensitized to what Christ died on that cross for. Going to go back in time just a little bit, uh, 1998 in Laos, uh, there was a missionary over there that established a congregation, and uh, at the time there was uh, 42 people there uh, that were in a Bible study, and finally the government, after giving them approval to do it, the uh, uh, village leaders gave them approval to do it because you see over there it's against the law to be a Christian, but they had the approval to be it, be doing this. Uh, they finally raided it. Uh, when things were all over after this, there was 13 that went to jail. The rest of them were released. When they got arrested, they separated the uh, foreigners. The missionary was one of them. And uh, there was a few people from around the world that was there at the time. Kept them five days, released them. But while the, he, uh, his name's Ken Fox, the missionary, he's in the cell, he's pacing back and forth. He's like, give me a cell phone, give me a satellite phone, I'm going to call the Marines, I'll show these people who's who. He always sticks his foot in his mouth, and this was one of the times. Then he turned around and saw all the loud Christians on their knees praying. It's about perspective. So how did it get down to 13? 13 were sentenced all the way from three years, two and a half years, and one year in prison. Now, the prison over there is not like ours. It's a lot different. Everybody else was released for a few reasons. Uh government connections, paying off the government, publicly renouncing Christ. That's how they got released. And these were Christians. Okay? So, horrible situation. The jail is in the middle of nowhere. It's about three miles on a 
through the jungle on a dirt road that you would have to traverse to get to this jail in order to give the prisoners stuff because they were sleeping on dirt floors, given a bowl of rice a day and a jug of water. So they would travel this road back and forth and they would have to carry enough stuff with them to bribe the guards. Um, that's the environment they're in, pretty bad. But you see, if God is God, and not only the idea of us putting him in the box, he's God only inside my box, but if he is totality God, he's in control of everything. Craziest thing happened. Uh, two men that Cynthia and I met when we traveled into Thailand, uh, Boon Lert and Kum Swang. Boon Lert uh, became a modern day Joseph. He became basically the internal warden of the prison. They were arrested originally for being Christians. At the time, they were under open, uh, open trades agreement discussion with the United States. One of the requirements is the idea of freedom of religion, so they changed it from being arrested for being Christians to uh, gathering to overthrow the government. So they're in jail for this. Originally, they were arrested for being Christians, so they were eventually given back their Bibles to teach English to the other prisoners and to the guards. They would weave baskets and uh, weave into them uh, scripture, and they were allowed outside the jail, actually, to sell it to uh, travelers. They were allowed to go up on top of the rooftop every Sunday morning to worship God. So my whole point of that is this. This whole concept of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. He is God. He is in control of everything. And we have to learn to die to ourself in the idea that I can't control everything. As Ken Fox said in that situation, give me a phone, I'll fix this. I'll get the Marines in here and we'll show them what for. We've got to let go of self. And that's part of the denial. We have to let go of self and the idea of dying daily. About the idea of carrying your cross daily. And the third thing is, is follow after me. So follow after me, the first, last part, the first part of it actually, you know, we read and it says, if any of you wish to come after me. So where is he? He is in heaven. We know he's there. He's seated at the right hand of God. So Jesus says to follow me. What does that mean? Well, it's a journey. It's about this idea of making it through this life, this physical world, in order to reach heaven. Because nothing's guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed from day to day. So this idea of setting priorities, you know, what's important to you in your Christianity? Is it more important for us, now I'm not picking on you guys, you guys are here, for wanting to sleep in instead of coming to church? Or I had a bad day at work, I'm not going to make it Wednesday night. You know, you can ask Cynthia about this. I am very good at self-justifying. I can justify just about anything. Um, normally when I want something. Uh, and we tend to do that. But you see, that goes back to the idea of we govern ourselves. We rule ourselves. We sit on the own throne. Homer Haley has this book out in... It's this idea that it covers Messiah, the, prophes uh, pro the Messiah of prophecy to the Messiah of the throne. And the best part that I love in this book is this one statement. He says, the essence of sin is dethroning, or excuse me, is enthroning yourself and dethroning God. That's the essence of sin. And that falls into line with the world in the worldly view, in the worldly concept, because it's all about you. It's not about the other person. It's about how you can excel, achieve, and overcome anybody, everything in this world. But you see, as Spencer talks about the upside-down world, that's not what Christ calls us to. That's not what our Christianity is about. That's not our spiritual walk, because our spiritual walk is far more than that. It's about dying to ourself daily for the sake of Christ, but also for others around us. 
So what does this all mean to us today? What does it come down to? It comes down to a couple things. I, I'm a very strong believer in the idea of talking about backing up to our baptism, our, our moments in time, for us to remember it because those were huge moments, for us to not to let go, for us to remember where we were, what would have stopped us, asking ourselves questions. How much did you read back then? How on fire for Christ were you back then? And then compare it to today. Now today's a lot different. We're a lot older, maybe. We have more responsibilities. We have no more requirements of us. Our job demands a lot. Our family life de demands a lot. But it should never come in to uh, interfere with your prayer life, your reading, fellowship, times of meeting, uh, Bible class, Wednesday, Sunday morning, worship, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, different activities that are set up within for this congregation. It should never come in to be in between that. And saying that, again, I'm not saying neglect family, your responsibility, your job, everything else, but there's ways to work around things if you stop and think about it. At my job, it was funny because I started there intending to quit four years ago. I'm still there. Uh, my manager back then, she's my manager now, one of my requirements that I, when I got hired was I was very open with this idea that I need Sundays and I would prefer Wednesday nights off because I worked any of the schedules. Uh, out of two years, I think it was maybe twice or three times I was unable to outside of our annual meeting. But if you're open and upfront with people, they normally work with you. But that means communication, that means expressing your, what you're needing and your desires. But we have to have the confidence that God is in control and he will help us and he does aid us and he will care for us. If we pray to him that we'll find, be able to, what we call nowadays, time management in order to devote more time to you in the idea of anywhere from prayer to reading to the gathering, do you think God would say no? I think we believe he would say yes, but that means, again, that means that we would have to be there. So what I would like you to do this week is to take time to think about these things. Go back to this passage and read over it, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and just think about this and how it impacts you. Go back to when the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ and what that meant. Think about your baptism and your relationship with Christ. And what does that mean? And how was it back then? And is there any change in who I am today? Because in this life, we're always to be moving forward. You know that old saying that if you're not moving forward, you're moving back. <laughs>